All right, it's 1202 and we've had a slow down a little bit on folks coming in from the waiting room. So I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Sarah Owsley. I'm the Advocacy Director at Empower Missouri. I'm very glad you've joined us for our Friday Forum today. Uh, we're going to talk about permanent supportive housing and other types of housing provision across the state. Um, it's a really large network of folks who are doing incredibly important work and really in a really under-resourced um, area for folks in our state. And it's a very misunderstood response system. Uh, it's really uh, difficult to um, really get a good grasp on unless you have personal experience or if you worked for uh, those types of organizations, et cetera. There's also a lot of misinformation uh, that exists out there about what permanent supportive housing is, housing first, um, et cetera. Uh, so I am very excited to uh, get to share that information with you today. Uh, this is part of a bunch of stuff that we're doing um, at Empower about permanent supportive housing and housing provision. Uh, so I'm going to put some links in the chat box as um, Amanda is speaking later about some of the with some of the things that Empower Missouri staff has written about permanent supportive housing and housing first. Uh, we're also going to invite you to our uh, day of action on March 27th in the Capitol, where we're going to be talking to lawmakers about a variety of things, but especially uh, permanent supportive housing and homeless response across the state um, and um, asking for evidence-based um, responses to those problems. Um, but our very first thing that we'll do is a welcome and networking, which we always do at our Friday Forum. We'll put you into some breakout rooms here in just a few minutes for about five minutes. Just introduce yourself and your organization. You can also put that information in the chat box um, if you'd like to put yourself, your organization, maybe how, you know, why you're joining us today, et cetera, just to capture that uh, for folks. Uh, then Amanda and Nathaniel are going to take it away. They've got lots of information to share with you, and we'll have an opportunity for questions um, as well as part of that. Uh, and please don't leave us until you filled out our evaluation so we know how to make sure that these uh, forums are what you want to hear, what you want to learn about, um, serving your uh, hopes and dreams for your interactions with Empower. Excellent. So I'm going to turn it over to our speakers. I am really happy to have lots of folks from the Missouri Balance of State COC join us today. Um, but Amanda and Nathaniel, I think, are sort of taking the lead for us uh, this afternoon. Um, I did want to go ahead and just point out that um, when I hear balance of state, I generally think like, this is not a very big area, right? Actually, it's all of the colored areas in their logo um, is the balance of state. And so they cover a great swath of uh, Missouri and work with the housing providers across a good portion um, of our state, especially our rural portions of our state. So they are doing really big, important work um, and working with great um, organizations uh, who are doing really big, important work for our neighbors. Uh, so Amanda and Nathaniel. Um, Amanda, you should have the ability to screen share. There we go. My computer is acting up for some reason. It always does when you're going to give a presentation. Right. It's like, no. All right. And of course, bear with me. I don't think it wants to be shared, but hey. Amanda, you can email it to me as well. I'm happy to share it, which you might have already done, but I don't think so. Computer's not working. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to email it to you because yeah. it won't go. I can almost share anything else but that. Perfect. Very so helpful. Let, yeah, so let me... Get this sent to you. I apologize, everybody. The joys of Zoom. I still haven't quite a hundred percent figured out the breakout room, so <laughs> that's always fun. 
All right, Sarah, see if you get that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the internet is a series of tubes and right. slow today. Got to make that joke twice this week. It makes me very happy. Yeah. All right. There we are. Oh, okay, there. Yep, you just let me know when to change them. Be like, go next. Okay. All right, I don't know if Nathaniel's made it on yet. Um, so we'll just go ahead and get started until he gets to pop on. So today um, we're going to talk about kind of understanding what Housing First is and the impact it has on the housing programs within the COC. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, this was just a little bit um, kind of a rundown of what the Missouri Balance of State is. Uh, hopefully everybody is somewhat familiar with it. We are a group of agencies within the HUD designated geographical region working together to end homelessness. Um, this is a member based organization and we are compromised of 10 regions. Adam is, oh, I see Nathaniel if he wants to pop in. <laughs> hey, good afternoon. I'll apologize for that. I had an important call we had to, had to take. I had to leave that one early, but uh, bouncing out. Um, yeah, so jumping in here, I don't know how much Amanda you'd gotten through on talking about the balance of state continuum of care as an entity. Um, and you just started this slide we're on here? Yes, just barely got into it. Perfect. All right, so I basically made it in time for the slide that's supposed to be <laughs> my responsibility here. So yeah, the balance of state continuum of care, it, it's for those who are not familiar with it, can be kind of a large entity. Um, basically, it's a network of agencies, a group of agencies within a HUD designated geographic region. So if you're curious about who drew those lines, um, is a HUD led process that creates these designated geographies. Um, and it's a member based organization. So within the 10 regions, there are um, a representative structure, you can see the regions on our map there. Um, but the members of the COC are the agencies and individuals that have signed on as members and individuals or agencies can there's there's an allowance for that um, however anyone who does rep, work at or represent an agency cannot also be an individual and have voting authority through both of those spaces just for transparency um, but an organization can can actually conducts the business of the coc as members um, membership to the organization is free and open to to folks so um, the the goal is really to create a body that is um Interest in fair and equitable housing, we could we often refer to our work as creating a system of care for homelessness, um, and it is meant to to encompass a lot of different assets of work. So we do um, collaboration with various different shelter programs, various different DV agencies, um, those serving those who are fleeing domestic violence. Uh, I realize I'm getting stuck in my acronyms too quick. So. Um, but those um, also public housing authorities as well. We do work closely with several of those. Um, so there's there's really a broad broad umbrella. Um, we also just have interested individuals that have signed on and, and been members that are just passionate about you know finding resources and serving the folks in their community. And that so the COC it, it can be kind of nebulous, but I think the easiest way to really think about it is that it is a membership body of folks who are trying to create a system of care and. There's a lot of nuance to that when you get into like the paperwork and the background and the and the funding and all those kind of categories. But at the end of the day, that's what we do. It's a network, it's membership, it's a group, and we we're working together in that space. All right, so a little bit, we mentioned the word system of care. Um, in, in talking about this, an important element of our work is is kind of considering the system of care for homelessness. And that's that's 
different. You can get into a lot of different kind of perspectives on, on what different folks do at the table um, and underneath the umbrella of HUD. And they all kind of have different spaces. And one of the notes that like a lot of folks who've worked with public and housing authorities, that's often people's main experience within HUD. They know like, oh, there's Section 8 or it's modern name of HCV, the Housing Choice Voucher. Um, and that's all folks often know. And that is truly a housing program. If you work with housing authorities, you know that they have a wait list and they work with folks that are low income. Many of folks who are not homeless um, receive Section 8 or Housing Choice Vouchers. And it's it's meant to alleviate the burden of housing and the burden for different folks in a community. It's not necessarily directed at homelessness. We are all about homelessness. We are all about prioritizing the folks in, in each community that we're working with that are in the highest need, that are really focusing on alleviating those individuals experiencing homelessness at a category that many other programs are not going to have the same resources and intent to serve. Uh, so, and I think housing authorities are a good example. If you look at the housing authority structure and budget, they don't have a huge amount of case management funding and supportive services funding. And it's because that's not the design, that's not the network. And so each one kind of operates in a, in a different need. And that's our space is really driving into the, system of care for homelessness. It's really driving into addressing those folks that don't have another space to turn, that don't have other resources or other ways to exit homelessness. And it is very much focusing on exiting homelessness. So we're not in the business necessarily of sheltering. Now we do work with shelters because they're valuable assets in providing the service, but rather than it being a fun, like a fundamentally sheltering program, it's about helping folks leave homelessness. And again, that should all work in, in balance with, uh, partners around the table to really address all of the needs a community might have, um, which I'll throw the, the microphone for everybody mic over to Samantha to talk a little bit about triage and prioritization and how that kind of works within our um, system. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the triage and prioritization as far as the coordinated entry system. This system is a central crisis response system that aims to well, hopefully quickly in homelessness for those that are experiencing it. Um, so with this, you can eff efficiently triage and prioritize individuals um, by looking at to see what interventions need to be done, um, who's the most vulnerable. And of course, this system here is designed to avoid duplicating funds or kind of making the best out of the minimum amount of available funds that there are. Um, it is a great, efficient, and effective system in place to help those that are experiencing homelessness. Now, Nathaniel, you talked about HMIS. Um, do you want more on that? or? Well, I think I'll... Um bring home that there's a, there's a lot of data requirements within the um, federal system and the Homeless Management Information System, HMIS, is a um, set of data expectations required by HUD. Um, a lot of third-party vendors and supporters out there create software and resources to collect this information and allow us to do specialized reports. Um, so a lot of the information that Congress gets as far as like the state of homelessness throughout the COC is driven by um, what we call the longitudinal system analysis, um, which you'll understand why we use acronyms very soon here. Um, LSA, much easier to say, but it's really, it's a, it's a kind of depiction of over a year period of time, over a year, um, all of the data that we've collected in our system of care and really being able to show what the trends are, what, what's happening. Um, and it does full demographic breakdowns and allows you to really see each community. And these get compiled on an internet, on a, well, on a nationwide level. Uh, within all of the COCs. And so that data set comes out of HMIS data. Um, many folks kind of don't always see like the direct impact of, you know, all of these different data elements that really have a meaningful space um, and do a lot of information. The HMIS is managed by a COC. Um, we partner with a designated lead agency that is Institute for Community Alliances. If the um, if you're not familiar with that, they're a wonderful agency, a nonprofit that's been partnering with many different COCs to um, create effective homeless management systems. And they they do our data and really do a wonderful job helping us do this and stuff. Um, the generating reports that both internally and externally, which I think is really valuable because we do we do internally review our own data and we're able to pull up our stuff and look at that. So not only is it going upstream and kind of informing our nation of what's happening, but it's also being used locally 
to make changes to address you know areas of growth that we need um, and to really evaluate effectiveness um, of you know how our coc is doing and what we're what how we can improve delivery of services which brings us into another fun data point um, we'll throw go into the uh, point in time count which is the other element that gets funneled into the reports to congress um, that's one of the major major pieces of the annual homelessness the AHAR. I don't actually remember what all the letters in that acronym are, but it's the it's a report to Congress on the state of homeless affairs, part LSA and part point in time count. So right. So the point in time for short hit count. Um this is conducted yearly throughout the state of Missouri and the different regions. So a single night in January um is chosen and during this the regions the communities the organizations they go out and determine how many people are homeless whether this is sheltered those that are in transitional housing or are in a shelter or those that are still um, out on the streets or abandoned buildings etc so just kind of like a snapshot in time um, so this snapshot that doesn't actually accurately reflect the total of number of homeless individuals throughout the year. So we have to keep that in mind. This is just a quick snapshot. Um, during this, so the pit count for 2023, not including the Kansas City area for Missouri, uh, we had 3,354 homeless people in shelter. And shelters where they're again that's transitional housing in a shelter also we had those that were living in an uninhabitable place that was 1183 so if we look at this by percentages uh 50 percent of the homeless population were in emergency shelters sorry um 39 percent were unsheltered and then, of course, of that shelter, 11% were in transitional housing. So safe havens weren't included in this count. So again, um, this is a snapshot. Not It does not remotely accurately show all the homeless people that we had for the day. And again, um, a lot of data comes back from this information, as Nathaniel said. So it kind of gives an idea of a little idea of what's going what's going on and then they have the numbers that they can keep going up the slide there uh we can hit the next Amanda slide. Or Nathaniel can yeah. you answer the question in the chat around why this oh, count sorry. doesn't include Kansas City no you don't need to watch it I'll I'll grab it if, I'll grab you if it can't wait yeah. so uh, uh the the long and sh short of the challenge with representing that data correctly across the different COCs is that our Kansas City COC is actually a two-state COC. Um, so it's very hard to kind of look at Missouri alone and be able to count that data. Approximately from what we, the, the rough statistics, approximately like two thirds of the population of greater Kansas City area live in the Missouri balance of state. They live outside of the Kansas City, Jackson County. Um, they still live in, in that area. Those, those folks are included in this report, but folks that live within Jackson County are included on a collective report between Jackson and Wyandotte County, which is the Kansas K County. Uh, so that data is not being used here. Um, so this shows a, a a fairly good snapshot. And I will say like part of the data with the point in time count and the challenge around it is that um, it's kind of based on COC and you get kind of these top level views of what each COC has. And it's not necessarily best representation, but from year to year, it allows you to identify trends and commonalities between different communities. So I, there are a lot of issues with the point in time and the and really what the value comes into is what happens when you look at a line of years and see a distinctive trend. You're able to say what like what's happening in your community. Are there improvements being made? Is there something going on? Is there something leading to more homelessness? Are we responding ineffectively? Um, and kind of raise those questions. And so actually our next slide, which Amanda's gonna talk on, talks a little bit about that, but so long, that's a longer answer. Um, Kansas City data is mingled between the two different states um, and it's hard to incorporate into this meaningfully. That's okay. 
So this next slide is just kind of a snapshot of the Missouri Balance of State COC, just kind of giving an idea of kind of where homelessness is going. So roughly here that um, you'll see 2015 right under 1,500 homeless individuals. And then somehow in 2017, we kind of dropped down and things were looking better. So with that, 2020 happened things, it kind of went above and beyond um, even what 2015 were. 2020, there was 1,569 homeless individuals and or families. And then in 2023, we continued to rise as 1,792 individuals were homeless. And again, this is for the Missouri Down to State COC. So it doesn't include Kansas City, the St. Louis area, I believe. I'm missing a few places. There are seven entitlement communities from the state of Missouri okay. um, for reference. So eight eight overall COCs that serve the state of Missouri. Seven of them are designated entitlement, and it is St. Louis County, St. Louis City, uh, St. Charles, Lincoln Warren as a tri-county COC. There's St. Joseph, which includes three counties, um, Kansas City, course and then there's also Joplin which includes two counties and Springfield which includes three I said that really fast so if I if you have questions about that there's a map on our website we can direct you to it'll be a lot easier than just rattling off stuff um, I also wanted to make a quick note on the point in time count is that um, as organizational structure methodology and things change it is very difficult um, our COC has been kind of increasing in capacity and ability last year too on the point in time count um, which means we've got more folks out on the street, more folks counting, you're going to find more folks. And so we do recognize that that is absolutely part of the increase in numbers that we've seen. Um, the other element that is true is that there, there is a nationwide trend. Um, you can look at COCs across the nation. All right, we can go uh, jump to the next slide. Um, I want to make sure that folks are on the same page when we talk about defining homelessness um, and kind of what. Is it just me that keeps freezing for Nathaniel? Nope. Okay. You might want to turn your screen off, your uh, camera off there, Nathaniel. It's just not as fun to hear from a black box, but it is more <laughs> fun than a freezing. Can you hear me better now? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just got the note that my internet connection is unstable. From yeah. Zoom. I'll also see if I can close down some background inf items. Well, I think we lost Nathaniel. Do not see him in the list. Amanda, are you able to talk about HUD's definition of homeless? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so as far as the ones that we're going to kind of focus on today would be the category one and category four, which is category one, you're literally homeless. Um, Amanda, I think you are also freezing. This is just the day of all the tech problems. Let's see. I think we heard you all say right. that you wanted to talk about category one and four. And then after that, I think we that's when we lost you. It's hard. 
our internet in the Can you hear me all right now? Yeah. Okay. I might have resolved my computer issue, but I think we're having some network difficulty. Yeah. So fun when you're completely powerless to fix the problem. Can you hear me all right now? We're, fingers crossed. Yes. <laughs> I switched internet connection on my device, um, which might be able to get us through for a little. Great. Not looking great, right then. Hello? Amanda? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, let's see if we can try this again. Awesome. I think internet problems have been universal today. All right, perfect. We're still good to go? Yeah. Okay. Um, so defining homelessness, uh, kind of lifting this category one and category four. Uh, let's Nathaniel second. Rural broadband, folks. I'd be happy to take it over, but I don't honestly know the different categories of homelessness that Pat has defined. Nathan, Amanda, I wonder maybe if somebody could call in on their cell or an office phone or something, if that would be easier. You should have a phone number in the calendar invite. Hello, can y'all hear me? Yeah. All right. Hopefully the internet will support us just, just doing the slideshow and we'll be able to talk through uh, join from my phone. Great. So apologies again to everyone for having some difficulties. Um, Perfect. Nate, I'm running I'm running your slideshow, Nathan. So. Oh, oh fantastic. Okay. Yeah. So you just that let makes... me know. I think we still don't have the, the definition for one and four just yet. <laughs> All right. 
Well, let's let's get through that. So definitions of homelessness, HUD makes these definitions um, essentially to really kind of create some sort of ideology around like what it means to be homeless, experiencing homelessness, and allows us to kind of recognize that with different programs and different eligibility and tailor resources to those. So they're numbered one through four, and we're really gonna be focusing on one and four. I'll just go ahead and mention category two is folks at imminent risk of homelessness, which involves having a um, direct notice of they will be homeless within 14 days. Mm -hmm. um, many COC programs don't make that a huge priority. Those folks are generally considered to be less vulnerable than folks who are currently on the street. And so that that is often less eligible for certain programs um, just because that is, that is not a prioritized level. Um, the element of Category one is anyone who is literally homeless in that they have been sleeping in an exposed location in a place not meant for human habitation, which would include a car or um, condemned buildings, um, or a person that is currently in a shelter with no other no other residents, nightly residents to call their own. Uh, so those that's kind of a brief overview of that. Category three is a whole nother curveball. It's homelessness under another statute. So if there's another law that would define a person as homeless, then they could be category three. Most of our COC programs do not tailor to category three at all. So we're gonna jump on to category four, which is a person fleeing domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, sexual abuse, or otherwise unsafe to go to their house because of an abuser that may cause harm to them. Uh, and it's very broad actually. And, and the, the full description is it's hard to, I don't even remember it all anymore because HUD just expanded it, uh, which is really exciting to see. Um, HUD has been very proactive and very, I think I have to give huge credit to this because they've allowed basically any program to recognize somebody as experiencing homelessness if that person feels like it's not safe for them to go home tonight. And that that opens a lot of doors. Um, category four homelessness does usually work with dedicated victim service provider agencies, um, but is not required to. Um, Non-victim service agencies can actually serve folks that are experiencing homelessness under category four. And we, we do that in our intake process to evaluate that. So, um, and that recent broadening has even included, like it's, it's really broadened the understanding of abuse to include technological abuse, emotional abuse, um, and broaden the concept of what a family member might be. Because originally a lot of the language was focused around intimate partner violence or inter inter part intimate partner abuse. Um, but it can mean anybody in the household. So you could be, you know, living with a brother or a sibling, and that person could be a danger to you or your well-being or your children. And that could be a reason to say that you are experiencing homelessness because that's your primary residence and it's not safe for you to go to. Uh, there is a distinction that anybody who does have a family member who will provide housing to them. So somebody who will say, you can sleep in my living room, sleep in my uh, spare bedroom, and that person is considered not literally homeless or not category four homeless because they have another resource that will allow them a primary nighttime residence. So a lot of nitty gritty. Um, mostly what we're looking at though is folks who are um, do not have a location to go to, do not have a space outside of the system. Um, so it does include shelter as, as actual homelessness, but it does not include staying, staying within a friend or families. It doesn't generally include so folks who are currently housed but will become homeless, and it doesn't, but it does include anybody who is experiencing domestic violence or any any other victim service related item can be considered homeless, uh, and that's that's what our COC really focuses it on. That's the priority, and that's what we're doing. There are other resources available that we do work to connect folks to. So I don't want folks to come away thinking, well, that's all they do. That everybody else is out of luck. Uh, they are served, they're served in other spaces. We do try to collaborate with other programs and make sure that um, the right services are available for individuals. So we can go ahead and jump to the next slide. Um, and Amanda, were you able to get back into the call? Are you here? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. So I don't think Amanda is able to get back in the call. I heard it for one second and then I heard a robot sound. Okay, well, 
I'll try to run from here. Um, Amanda gave put together. I have to give Amanda credit. She put together the resources today and put together most of the speaking notes. So if you hear me say anything you like, it's because she did it. Um, so chronic homelessness is a, a distinction that we make within our system. Um, that is a specific eligibility criteria within certain programs, um, and it does involve needing uh, to verify a disability, be able to document a disability that a person has. So that is a very broad category that can include anything from um, physical, neuromuscular issues. It can include any sort of um, psycho psychological disability. Um, and the verification on that is fairly open as well. Um, the does have to meet HUD's definition of category one or four homelessness um, and does have to be able to document 12 months of homelessness in the three year period prior to that moment. Um, and that's that's it. That's an allowance for HUD to basically say yeah, either you've been homeless for a year or over the past three years, you've had a, a year's worth of homelessness that really highlights an individual that's been chronically dealing with homelessness ongoing. Uh, we do have another question in the chat. Um, have they made any changes to how they consider someone who is paying themselves um, who is paying themselves for a motel or hotel? So that has not been changed. Um, HUD still considers anybody who manages to self-pay at a hotel to be considered housed. And a lot of folks, and I think rightfully, you know, call that into question as, well, that, that person is still homeless. Um, but a lot of what we're doing in the COC world is not necessarily addressing the totality of homelessness, but prioritizing the most vulnerable in homelessness. Um, and so somebody who is able to self-pay in a hotel is being demonstrated as having more resources and needing less support than somebody who is not able to do that. Um, now, somebody who's is, you know, panhandling, scratches enough funds to stay one night in a hotel has not exited homelessness. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that, that might, that's not going to be seen even as a break in homelessness. So uh, just because you got one night out, then that, that doesn't necessarily mean someone is not category one homeless. Uh, but if a person is able to pay for a hotel room, like by a weekly rate, you know, so socially we might consider them homeless, but on HUD system, we do not. Thank you. All right, so diving into the CE system, coordinated entry is 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 a lot to unwind, um, but long and short, I wanna focus in on, on, it allows us to create a referral system. It allows us to create references to projects and allows other systems to coordinate with the overall system of care. So it is earned the name coordinated um, and it's earned the name entry. This is the process by which an individual gets the housing solution that should allow them to exit homelessness. And it uses a prioritization model. I think we touched on that earlier. The prioritization is really focusing on using distinctive ways to identify the individual with the most need in our current communities. And so it is very much focused on folks that are currently working with the system, folks that are the highest acuity of need right now, right here. Um, there is a 60 day inactivity practice in this. So it's not, it's not a wait list. It is, if somebody hasn't been in contact with the case manager in 60 days, they're considered inactive and are not part of coordinated entry, uh, which is a twist again from other systems. And that's because this is our lane, this is our process, and it is meant to work in harmony with everyone else. We don't do that part because section eight will have a wait list and eventually get to somebody. Um, the coordinated entry system is about prioritizing and finding the best way to, to work with folks right, right here, right now kind of principle. Um, it also allows folks to really diversify what they might need. So a person might come into one agency that has certain funding and certain programs, but if they do the coordinated entry intake, um, there may be another another agency within that community that has a better program for that person's needs. Um, we often see this with you know folks fleeing domestic violence that they might come into an agency that's just addressing homelessness. And the person says, yeah, I'm homeless because I can't go home. You say, oh, that's category four, you're fleeing domestic violence. And the housing program that they might be housed with could be a program that's dedicated to serving folks that are survivors of DV, whereas their intake might not be from that agency. And so it allows a lot of um, interagency work to really focus in on the projects that have the right resources for each client and does allow kind of our system to um, really focus in on making sure the client gets the referral 
from the agency that they need and avoids the client needing to go to all of the different agencies and ask for all of the different resources, um, which can create duplication of services, which isn't HUD's intent, um, and also can create kind of confusion around um, you know, what to do to get, get that entry. This allows folks to really just go to one space. Once they're in the system, they're able to find the right resources. And again, not everyone qualifies for coordinate entry by our definitions, so we do allow for collaboration with other um, other resources. So, quick note: uh, some myths and misconceptions about homelessness. And I do recognize that due to our technological delays uh, issues, we we probably need to move some of these quickly. So I'll just kind of um, touch on this and uh, invite folks to you know follow up with us later um, as needed. Um, but we do want to point out that the one of the major you know, myths around homelessness is that people that are experiencing homelessness are violent and dangerous. Uh, research that has really shown that that is not true. Um, there, there's a substantial amount of folks that are experiencing homelessness that are typically the victim of violence. And so what we see across the actual system statistics is that people experiencing homelessness are more likely to be a, a victim of violence th than a perpetrator. Uh, and that's you know that comes back to our responsibility to to provide services and shelter and try to try to address that rather than leave people exposed um, because because of that misperception and a lot of folks do do operate in kind of a, a wrong direction because of that um, also laziness is a major myth um, many many folks that are experiencing homelessness do work uh, and there's a substantial amount of folks that are working homeless um, which is a, I think a, a major highlight to the fact that this is a, a systemic issue. This is not a preference or, or choice. This is not a um, separate issue than other things. There are people who are working every day and cannot maintain their housing, uh, which, is, which is an issue. The barriers surrounding homelessness to maintaining employment are, are also robust. And so folks that are, would love to work, um, if they can't actually find themselves a, a, a feasible career opportunity because they don't have an address, they're not able to shower, they're not able to maintain clean laundry, they're not able to maintain uh, professional dress, they can be often hard to enter the workforce, um, and other folks are, end up doing work under the table that is can be dangerous and abusive. Um, so we also wanna address homelessness as a choice, that is a myth and misconception. Um, if you speak to folks who are experiencing homelessness, that is not the intent that folks have. Uh, there are a lot of barriers, a lot of challenges, and a lot of crises that uh, are associated with people experiencing homelessness. Um, and in our modern state, you know, in the nation that we live in, um, currently many, many of our families are one crisis away from being homeless. Uh, that's been shown through many different environments um, in financial reviews, looking at um, financial studies, looking at financial security, get the words right on that. Um, so either it's a healthcare crisis or it's a loss of a job, uh, many families will become homeless because of one small disruption. So I want to skip on to the next topic, housing first. And this is something that I really want to make sure that we sing the song for. Um, housing first is a really critical element within our community. Um, and this, this again comes into the play of you know, different folks in different lanes doing different services. The continuum of care operates on this housing first principle because we believe we are you know, dedicated to serving the most vulnerable persons. And what Housing First means is that our method, our approach and principle is to address the housing needs and use those as a foundation to address the other service needs a person might have. Um, a lot of kind of misconceptions about Housing First to believe that it's a housing only and housing only is fundamentally not Housing First. Housing First is not a program by which somebody gets into a home and gets abandoned. Uh, that is not exiting homelessness, that is not changing the system, that is not addressing the needs, uh, that is, that is that is a flawed perception that many do have, but Housing First um, really does operate. And I, the other thing I want to stress, it's a principle. We we work on the principle that we need to address the housing needs first. Before before somebody can get through recovery, they off, they need a safe place to sleep at night. Before somebody can get through, um, you know, other psychological challenges around anxiety or trauma or issues like that, if they don't have a safe place to, to sleep at night, they're not going to be able to make the progress that they would need to make in other spaces. And a lot of folks kind of reckon, feel like, well, there's other programs, there's in, you know, in facility programs, and some of those do have some level of success, but the data has generally supported the fact that housing first approaches are more effective because it creates more personal autonomy and more ability to actually resolve issues. 
Um, so th th it's a very critical element. Um, and I just say, uh, you know, that it's not operated, you know, in perfect, perfect design. There's a reality if you've ever worked with a landlord and tried to collaborate that um, any given landlord might have expectations for a client and you can't just, you know, well, we operate housing first and so landlords don't always work housing first. Um, they want to see somebody, you know, be a reliable tenant before they're going to work with them. And if somebody's trying to build a credit score, it'll be a lot easier with safe place to live, but often can be a barrier to a, t a landlord signing on that lease. So there are challenges associated with that. And that's why it's a principle, principle driven ideology. So the, and that focus again, coming back to housing stability and well-being. Um, when somebody has a stable space, when somebody has that capacity to actually engage in their own goal making and, and decision making, uh, we do see a consistently higher degree of success and a person's continuing to self-sustain following any sort of service or intervention. Once you, once you have somebody in a safe space, you're able to provide a lot of healthcare services um, that people are able to pursue health care um, and also able to address all of the other challenges. And so part of the reason Housing First works, and we know the data has shown Housing First is an effective strategy, uh, this allows folks to really self-define their needs. It allows folks to lead that conversation for them and allows folks to actually resolve the barriers they are facing to homelessness. Uh, many, many, many of the barriers to housing are related to the fact that people don't have a safe space, don't have an address, don't have a, a place to clean clothes, to store clothes, to maintain their resources, and they, they will never become self-sustainable unless those are addressed. Um, quick note too, housing stability, well-being, these issues focused around housing first are critical for those that are in high acuity, high need, vulnerable spaces. Um, folks with other resources, folks that are not in, you know, the prioritized clients that we're working with um, do find that, you know, that's not the approach for everybody, for everything, for every program. It's the approach for our focus when we're dealing with these um, individuals that are chronically homeless, have substance abuse histories and challenges. Um, and rec the most recent study in 2020 that was a very comprehensive liter literature review um, invite folks to read into this. Uh, it's it, they do a wonderful breakdown of many, many different data points that we could spend another hour teaching on. Um, but they they were able to to really evaluate that all the data supports this idea that housing first is the best way to decrease homelessness within a community, and it is substantially more effective than taking a treatment first approach. This brings us to our critics. Um, many folks feel like housing first will lead to more drug use and mental health crisis. And th that's one of those fundamental myths that the research has just straight up shown is not true. Um, research has consistently demonstrated reduction in use of alcohol, stimulants, and opiates. Uh, housing first allows folks to seek recovery and, and a number of folks that are in, in a state of homelessness, experiencing homelessness, and also in substance abuse are looking for resources, looking for ways to exit. And the folks that are able to be prioritized through our programs in the COC are able to find a foundation that actually allows them the ability to do that. Um, the research has consistently supported that. Um, the, the literature review that we cited in the slide before is an excellent resource and we would recommend folks dive into that. Um, couple of notes on transparency, we'll just quickly address this because I think I said some of these things. Um, it addresses the barriers, it address, it's been proven to be more cost effective, it increase, increases the autonomy of the client and the folks um, working with that. And then the other element is that it does rely on a lot of voluntary participation from other system and resources. Um, we do rely on landlords you know, to address you know, housing clients with, with great need and still ongoing challenges. Um, and there are you know, a certain number of folks that will abuse the system and that's always gonna happen, um, but we do find that number the research has consistently shown the folks that do abuse a housing first model is so much less significant than the folks that will fail a treatment first option. Hey, Nathaniel, so, before we move forward real quick, I just want to, it is 1257. Yes. We are set to be done at one o'clock. I can hang out with you if you are able to stay, finish your presentation. Um, I can ask any questions that are waiting in the chat box, and then we're going to send this recording out. So if folks are not able to um, hang on, I don't want them to miss um, some parts. Are you able to do that with us? 
I do have another meeting that uh, okay. one o'clock, but I could probably extend this approximately uh, 10 minutes or so. Perfect. Um, That's great. Excellent. I won't interrupt you again. I'll stick uh, some info in the chat box. If you could fill out our survey before you go, that would be great. And you're all set, Nathan. Go back. Perfect. All right. So try to move fast, though, too, because I want folks to be able to see as much as they can. Um, our housing first oriented programs. There are two main program types that we utilize within the COC system, and that is the rapid rehousing programs and the permanent supportive housing. So we'll start with permanent supportive housing. Um, that what that is, is a housing intervention that combines affordable housing assistance with voluntary community support services or a, that an individual can participate in, but is not required to because of the housing first model. Um, folks, but folks are required to have made available to them a monthly service call that they can participate in and address any needs. So um, can we skip ahead on the slides real quick? There we go. Uh, rapid rehousing is the alternative project and rapid rehousing is meant to be a much faster, quicker, distinctive turnaround. It does not require the same degree of um, chronicity and, and vulnerability of an individual, and is meant to be a short-term resolution. Uh, so the permanent supportive housing it is really focused on folks experiencing chronic homelessness, have disabilities, have not been able to exit homelessness by any resolution of their own um, over a given, like we talked about, a 12-month period, a 12-month cumulative over a three-year. That really is identifying there are not other services that are going to address this person's homelessness. So that critical need is really represented in this space. Um, so you can see there, long-term assistance reduces chances of turn to homelessness. Uh, just case in point, um, the permanent supportive housing system in the in our balance of state has a 96% efficacy rate. Um, 96 clients over the last two years have either retained homelessness, retained housing, or not exited the program. Um, or not return to homelessness. Sorry, there's, if for, and to get the data points nice and quick, um, but long and short, uh, when folks do exit the system and return to the system, that is a, an identified element um, that is present. So we do see that um, this is wildly effective. Permanent supportive housing is also, um, a, very cost effective, which is an element we'll, we'll touch on a little bit. Um, the challenges associated with permanent supportive housing, you know, really do um, hinge on the fact that we're dealing with folks in very, very high vulnerability needs. Um, folks that are not able to address those other barriers, um, health problems and um, deep poverty, uh, health issues that are often barriers to them maintaining any sort of stability. Uh, with that being said, I wanna jump on to uh, rapid rehousing, um, which is again, a short-term housing. Uh, Couple more slides. Um, rapid rehousing allows us to um, really provide an effective service for folks to exit homelessness and, re and return to stability with whatever is appropriate for their need. We do again prioritize and set clients through the for the best program, um, as always, to to identify the way that folks will, folks will actually exit homelessness. And so that's really the drive here. There are many folks that have experienced a crisis of, how, of homelessness and are able to resolve that quickly by just simply getting a three-month support through a rental program and address any other barriers such as utility costs that, you know, may be um, creating other, other challenges. So there's a, there's a lot of resources that are available through different programs. And they're all different. I just want to state this too. If you've worked within the rapid rehousing programs and thought, well, that one didn't work, um, every rapid rehousing program has a slightly different design. We work collaboratively as a COC to, you know, understand each program and effectiveness for each given client. And we do see that this is generally a very effective strategy. Um, one of the things we really want to bring home is that not only is cost is rapid rehousing cost effective as far as a resolution of homelessness, but this makes a huge impact in local expenses. Um, emergency room visits drastically decrease when rapid rehousing programs are in place. Um, other community services that end up costing communities significant amounts of funds are dramatically reduced. So we'll, and that's in our, our work cited, you can see that the paper from Cohen 2022 that showed the impact within the local communities. And 
again, these are federal dollars coming into your communities that are able to reduce local community costs. And so not like, even if you just look at the overall numbers, we see it's a cost benefit analysis that comes out in favor of our, our entire nation. But on your community, especially, it's, it's an important thing to know, federal dollars come in and make your community expend less local dollars. And that makes that a huge asset um, and it's, it's, a, it's a huge resource. I think we've touched on throughout our conversation all of the different barriers. Um, housing involves a substantial amount of barriers. And one of the things that we exist to do as the COC program is really focus in on resolving those barriers, resolving those issues that, that prevent folks from being able to exit homelessness. And that's really our focus. Um, we, that system of care is all around recognizing, identifying, and eliminating those barriers, whether they're um, financially related, whether they're community, community social related, whether it's a stigmatization issue, whether it's, um, you know, we needs to engage with new landlords to evaluate that, there's a substantial amount of challenges associated with that. And we get to operate as you know, a really core central system to deal with the folks that have the most substantial barriers. And that's always our focus. Um, where we need to focus in our resources is the folks that don't have as many other resources out there. Uh, so again, there's, there are sheltering dollars available in our state. There are, there are housing dollars through public housing authority that are available in our state and our communities. Um, and those all work in tandem. We maintain close relationships with uh, the emergency solutions grant recipients um, and close with a lot of the public housing authorities. So I've rushed, rushed through a lot of that and I know there might've been some other chat questions. Um, I think the only I, chat box question that I saw, Nathan, is if there is a way to move this process along quicker for families that are already on the coordinated entry list. Basically, can we move households um, into services faster? Absolutely, and that's a great question. Um, so one of our ongoing systemic challenges is finding ways to create a more responsive and more resource-filled service. Um, we do recognize there are limited resources, but we do not have enough funds from HUD to resolve all of homelessness. We just, it, it won't happen. We are triaging and prioritizing. And so the best thing that can be done is recognizing clients that really have the highest acuity that need to make sure they're represented effectively as being high acuity. Um, we do, rec we've seen multiple times where an individual has presented the system and has sometimes not provided full transparency on challenges or issues or barriers they may be facing. And so they appear to be less need they, and they are not prioritized. So making sure that clients are effectively represented is an important element. Um, and then our system also, because it uses that referral system and is focused on permanent exits from homelessness, um, finding an avenue for a person to leave homelessness and not return, be able to maintain financial stability for the rest of their life after this. Uh, that is the goal. Of course, there, there are a lot of challenges associated with that, but that is the intent. Um, and that means that we're not always focused on the emergency shelter needs. Ideally, there are immediate resources available for folks that allow them to maintain some stability. Um, but the, the overall preference, the priority in our lane, and I wanna really stress that the priority in our lane is focusing on the programs that will create that permanent exit, more so than resolving the immediate crisis in this moment. And we do recognize that there is, that that can present other other areas for harm. We do try to minimize, you know, the challenges within there, but there are folks that spend a week, spend sometimes upwards of a month in shelters or in different programs waiting for a program referral to come through and can take some time before the right, the right bed and the right resources available. Um, we do want folks to know that, you know, coordinated entry is not an emergency response. It's a permanent solution response. And that's just different, that's different lanes, it's different resources and different spaces. We do try to create. Oh, this time, Nathan, I think you accidentally muted yourself. We might have lost him. Um, like I said, I will uh, send out a copy of this recording of today to everybody. I will ask uh, Nathan and Amanda if I can use their slides and send those out as well.
Um, I, I want to just draw, there's a couple of announcements there in the chat box. You can join our Affordable Housing Coalition or any of our coalitions, learn more about what Empower Missouri is doing, sign up for our newsletter and more at empowermissouri.org. Um, you can also register to join us at our week of action, March 25th through the 28th. On the 27th, um, we're going to be in Jefferson City. We invite you to join us for our day of action. The Missouri Balance of State COC is one of our partners co-hosting that event with us. So you can join us to go talk to lawmakers about permanent supportive housing, about housing first, about homeless response, how important it is, um, and all of the things to protect the, that process in our state. Uh, I really uh, appreciate your time today and being flexible with all of our tech issues. You know, the internet, it's a, it's a problem. <laughs> it's a blessing and a, and a problem, right? Um, so I appreciate that so much. Nathan, were you, I saw you come off mute for a second. I'm not sure if there was anything else you wanted to say before we send folks out. I think that's about it. I just want to encourage folks to um, don't hesitate to reach out to the Missouri Balance of State COC if you have any questions. We can also connect you with the other COCs in the state of Missouri. Um, they're a great, wonderful group of folks, and we do collaborate quite a, quite often to provide resources. So we're just we're the in between, but there's a lot of other communities. There's lots of other work that's happening, and we're all happy to help and work with you. Yeah, absolutely, Nathan. Thanks, everybody. We really appreciate your time today. Um, have a great afternoon. Bye, everyone.